<clears throat> now we started off this chapter, Galatians chapter 5, and the part I want to focus in on is the very end there where it talks about the fruit of the Spirit, which is actually our Bible memory passage. Look at verse number 22. The Bible's talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Now, before I get into this, actually, I want to preface this real briefly um, about the fruit of the Spirit. We see the, the fruit of the Spirit is, is followed up here. Um, it's following up the, the works of the flesh. So starting in verse 19, the Bible lists up all of these different sins, all these different things that are considered the works of the flesh. The things that you do that your, your fleshly body will cause you to do. And it lists off, you know, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, all these other things. Witchcraft, hatred, uh, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murder, you know, all these different things saying, look, these are wicked, these are sinful, these are the works of the flesh. This, these are the, what your flesh is going to do. When you're walking in your flesh, your flesh is going to drive you to do these things. And it contrasts that with the fruit of the Spirit, with when you're walking in the Spirit of God, we are walking in the Holy Spirit. Obviously, this is the people who are already saved. When you're walking in the Spirit, this is the fruit. This is the result. This is the, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Now, I'm focusing in the, the entire sermon on one of these points, but I kind of want to briefly touch all of them. Because as a Christian, you know, walking in the Spirit, you should find yourself having love. Now, love isn't just some overwhelming feeling with, the, with this inside of you where you just somehow just, I just feel love. Love is something that you take action on when you, you, know, you, you prove your love, you show your love by doing things. So when you're walking in the Spirit, the very first thing that's mentioned there is love. You should be loving other people and preaching them the gospel of Christ, telling them the truth, letting them know that there is a heaven and there is a hell and that the price for their sins has been paid for and speaking the truth in love, tell them how to be saved. When you're walking in the Spirit, you do these things. The next thing is joy. When you're walking in the Spirit, you should be happy. You shouldn't be down. You shouldn't be depressed. You shouldn't have, um, you know, you should, you should be happy with serving God. And it is something that will happen if you are walking in the Spirit. It is a joyful thing. If you, if you don't feel like you have very much joy in your life, then maybe you should check how often you really are walking in the Spirit and how much you're doing. You know, if you're, if you're miserable all the time, if you're angry, if you're irritable, if you have, you know, the lust of the flesh, the Bible says it's hatred and it's strife and variance and, you know, being angry and, and, and fighting with people um, all the time, if that's your demeanor. Now, I'm not saying there's not a spiritual fight and that we're not contending for the faith. Of course we are. But just in general, with, with your family, with people that you, that you come into contact with, you know, do you have joy? If you're walking in the Spirit, you should have joy. You should have peace. This next one is what I'm going to focus the, the entire sermon on. is long-suffering. We'll get into that soon. But gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, being, you know, being humble, being meek, not being lifted up in pride, and having temperance, being able to control yourself, control your emotions, control your body, control the things that you're doing. When you're walking in the Spirit, you should have all of these things because these are the fruits of the Spirit. It says, against such there is no law. These are all good things to have. These are all good qualities. There is no law forbidding any of these things. It says, and they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. If you're saved, you have the Spirit of God. If you're living in the Spirit, we need to walk in the Spirit. Let's see, would you take her out and correct her and teach her how to sit still in church, please? Now let's get into long-suffering. God is long-suffering toward us in many ways. Let's start off by going over our salvation because I want you to think of all of the sins that you have committed prior to your salvation, even after your salvation. Just think of all of the sins in your personal life. Take a minute to just reflect, to sit back, and think about all of the wickedness and sinfulness that you've had in your life. 
Think about the things that you've committed, things that you're ashamed of, things that you've done that you wish you hadn't done before. Think about maybe some of your most grievous sins against God, especially prior to your salvation. Think about all the things that you've done. Yet God was still long-suffering enough to allow you to, to come to repentance, to allow you to come to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and to, to believe on His name for your salvation. Turn, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter in chapter number 3. Just a few pages, a little bit forward in your Bible from Galatians. 2 Peter chapter 3. And we're going to be reading in verse number 9. The Bible reads, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So what this is talking about, it's talking about the day of the Lord. It's talking about when Jesus Christ returns. And he's saying, you know, God's not slack. God's not going to, um, you know, when, when God makes a promise, He's not just going to forget about it. God's going to come through on his, on his promise, and He's not slack about it, as some men count slackness. It says, but He's long-suffering to us. Lord. The reason why God is allowing this time to pass between you know, the, the prophecies of Jesus Christ and Him actually coming back is because He's long-suffering to us. Don't think that just because Jesus Christ hasn't come back yet, oh, well, He must never be coming back. You know, that's what the mockers will say. Oh, well, where is He? And the Bible says, in the last day, the last days, perilous times will come, and, you know, people will be mockers and, and, um, and deceivers, and they're going to be, you know, asking, well, where is the sign of His coming? Because it's been such a long time since Jesus was first on this earth. But the reason for that, the Bible tells us, is because God is long-suffering to us. God is, is, and you know, that word long-suffering just means He suffers long. He has, he has a lot of mercy. He is extending a lot of mercy to us. He's long-suffering. He's suffering the things that are happening for a long period of time. That is what long-suffering means. It says, but He's long-suffering to us word not willing. God does not want. He's not willing that anyone should perish. That any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants us all to believe on Him. God wants us all to come to that repentance. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He doesn't want that for you, which is why He's long-suffering. He allows things to happen. When you are doing things that are, that are sinful and you've, you're turning your back on God and, and you're, you're not wanting to have anything to do with them, Prior to your salvation, look, God is long-suffering. You are continuing to, to break God's commands and continuing to do things contrary to God's law, contrary to His Word, and you're living a certain way. Yet God has this long-suffering because He doesn't want you to perish. He wants you to come to repentance. So prior to salvation, I could think of all these sins that I have committed and how incredible it is that I was even allowed to continue living to the point to where I can get saved because of after all the things that I've done against God, yet God was still long-suffering. I'm sure many of us have the same testimony where we could say, yeah, you know, we've done all kinds of horrible things against the Lord, and a lot of it was out of ignorance, but some of it wasn't necessarily, and, you know, but God loves us so much, and, and a demonstration of His love is His long-suffering. And what He allows um, us to, to go through before you know, the final judgment comes. And that's what He's talking about here with His judgment coming with Jesus Christ. But look at verse 11, 2 Peter 3, 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, talking about the things on this earth, what manner of persons ought ye to be? In all holy conversation and godliness. He's saying, seeing everything here is going to get burned up. You know, how, how ought you to be behaving? In, in holy conversation and godliness, verse 12, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt 
with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. Remember, one of the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. And if you're living in the Spirit, then you'll be without spot and blameless. He says in verse 15, an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Turn, if you would, to Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. We're going to look at a, at a bunch of verses tonight regarding long-suffering and understanding what long-suffering is and how we ought to have long-suffering in our lives. First, we see attributes of God. This is a godly attribute. This is something that we see that, that the Lord has. And the first references we're turning to here is God is the one that has long-suffering. God is the one that suffers us and that, and that when we're doing bad and when we're wronging Him and when we're being disobedient to Him, He suffers us long. This is the attitude that we need to make sure we have with other people. We need to have an attitude of long-suffering. And what's the opposite of long-suffering when you're real short? Right? When you're short suffering, when people can wrong you or say something and then you're real short with them right off the bat, it's just you're irritated, you're aggravated, and, and you know, you're going to treat them the way they're treating you. That would be short suffering, but we need to be long suffering. Look at Numbers 14, verse number 17. The Bible reads, And now I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great, according as thou hast spoken, saying, the Lord is long-suffering. And look at the rest, of, the, the rest of these words kind of help define. They're all, they're all um, similar in meaning to long-suffering. The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people according unto the greatness of thy mercy and as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. God is long-suffering. It also means because he's so long-suffering, he's of great mercy. God extends mercy. He doesn't hold things, hold everything over you. He's merciful. He's merciful in his judgment. He's merciful in, in the way that he treats our bad behavior because he forgives iniquity and transgression. And if forgiveness means it's taken care of, it's done. When you're forgiven of something, when you do something wrong against somebody else and they forgive you, that forgiveness is like that thing never happened. It's like you didn't really do wrong. Now, you actually did it, but when someone forgives you, they're making it where you don't have to, to make any correction, any rightness to the wrong that you've done because you've been forgiven. And this is the way that God forgives us. You know, we've broken His commandments, but if your faith is in Christ for your, as your Savior, you are forgiven of your, of your sins. You're forgiven of your trespasses against the Lord. And the Bible says that as far as the east is from the west, so far as God separated us from our sin. God forgives and He forgets. He says, their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. And you know, these godly attributes, this long-suffering, this great mercy, these are things that we ought to have in our life. When somebody wrongs you, now it takes humility. And think about how great of a God the Lord really is to have this type of mercy. Now look, God is holy. God is perfect. God is without sin. God has no wrong, yet He still suffers us who are full of sin, who, who you know, do all kinds of, of things against our Lord. He's long-suffering of great mercy and He forgives. When we have a God that's so great as that and capable of forgiving, where do we get off holding grudges against people and not, allow, and not being forgiving of others? when they do wrong unto us, when they say things that we don't like, when, you know, whatever the case may be, 
we need to have the, strive to have these same type of attitudes. Turn if you would to Psalm 86. We're going to see some more attributes of God. The loving, compassionate, merciful, long-suffering God. It's important to have the proper fear of the Lord and to understand the proper punishments and, and you know, that God will mete out when we do sin, when we do wrong. But it's also equally important to point out His great mercies. To point out His long suffering. Because those are examples that we need to live by. Psalm 86. Look at verse 15. Psalm 86. The Bible reads, But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious. And what's grace? Grace is something that's given that you don't deserve. It's undeserved. Love is graciousness. God is full of compassion. He feels for us. He's gracious. He's long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. God has lots of mercy. God has lots of truth that He is providing us. Take her out again, please. O turn unto me and have mercy upon me. Give thy strength unto thy servant and save the son of thine handmaid. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter number 4. Ephesians chapter number 4. Now, we saw already those, the, the few examples that we started off with. Those were attributes of the Lord. Those were God's attributes of being long-suffering. Those were God's attributes of being merciful. But now we're going to see admonitions unto us, specifically written out for us to keep this same type of an attitude, to keep the same type of mentality that God has. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 1, the Bible reads, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, isn't that interesting? He's talking about the unity of the Spirit. Why, why are we going to have the unity of the Spirit? The unity is the, the keeping that bond of the Spirit within the church together. And it's, it's kept together with lowliness, and meekness and long suffering, those are the fruits of the Spirit. So, when you don't have the fruits of the Spirit, you know, you're not going to be unified. We're unified through the Spirit of Christ. And it says here that we need to have lowliness and meekness. Because, look, you're not going to be long suffering towards someone if you're proud, if you're lifted up, if you're thinking of yourself so much higher than everyone else. And here, here's, you know, the reason why this is so important. Oftentimes, churches who preach hard on sin and they're full of people who know the truth and actually are starting to live a godly life and have gotten lots of sin out of life and they're holding themselves to this high standard and are really starting to walk a lot better. Churches that are like this have a tendency to be full of people that type, tend to get this holier-than-thou type of an attitude. They have this attitude where they start to get lifted up in pride, thinking that they're better than other people because they've gotten so many sins out of their life. And look, the, you know, um, when people are lifted up in pride, pride cometh before a fall. Okay, there's going to be a great fall that comes. And we need to watch out. We need to make sure that we have, that we are walking in the Spirit and that we have the fruits of the Spirit, that we are long-suffering, that we are, have, in, in order to be that way, like I mentioned, we need to have a lowliness about ourselves and a meekness, esteeming others better than ourselves, long-suffering, forbearing one another. So again, that word forbearing is very similar, long-suffering. It's essentially synonymous. You're able to bear the burdens of, the, of what people are, are presenting you with. When people are, are maybe a burdensome unto you, you forbear one another in love. You're allowing things to happen. You, you know, people say things, maybe a rude comment. Maybe someone slights you or wrongs you in some way. We need to have a forbearance. We need to have a long-suffering attitude that suffers long. 
with the same long suffering, or at least try to have the same long suffering that God has towards us. This is the way, when we're walking in the Spirit, we need to be dealing with people. It's one of temperance. We're not allowing ourselves to get all upset and all irritated and angry and flying off the handle because someone said or did something wrong to us. We need to have this long suffering. Look at Colossians chapter number 1. Colossians chapter number 1. Verse number 9, the Bible reads, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord, unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now before we read verse 11, I want to point out there in verse 10, he's, he's giving them this, he said we're praying that you can be filled with all wisdom. Why? So that you can walk worthy of the Lord. And he starts to explain how they can be walking worthy of the Lord. Verse 11, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Now there we see, you know, patience, again being patient with people and having long suffering with joyfulness. Don't have long suffering with bitterness. It's one thing to, to be able to suffer people long and still be bitter about it. We need to be have long suffering with joyfulness. Because that's what, what the fruit of the Spirit is going to bring. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Turn to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. We're in chapter 1. Just a couple pages over to chapter 3. Verse number 12, the Bible reads, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, now look, this is something that you have to put on. He's saying, you know, you have to consciously put on. We have to consciously be walking in the Spirit and choosing, you know what, I'm not going to fulfill the lusts of the flesh today. The, the Spirit warreth against the flesh and the flesh against the Spirit. This is a continual battle. We need to die to selves daily. We need to put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies. Your flesh is not going to, you're not going to naturally want to be merciful to people in your flesh. But the Spirit is. The Spirit has mercy. Kindness. Humbleness of mind. Again, you might have a lot of knowledge. You may have gotten a lot of sin out of your life, but don't let that lift you up. You need to continue to stay humble. Humbly serving. Meekness. Long-suffering. There's that word again. Being long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. There's the forgiveness. We haven't seen it up to this point yet, but even though it's been implied, when you forbear one another, when you have long suffering, you also need to be able to forgive. <clears throat> Forbearing one another, forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Now when you think about people who do you wrong and say rude things to you and and, and do whatever to you in your life, maybe someone you'd consider an enemy, have they wronged you the way that you've wronged God? Have they wronged you to that extent? I mean, think about that for yourself. Think about all, that's why I had you think about the sins that you've done in the past. Think about your sinful life. Think about how much you have wronged God. Because what the Bible's saying here is that even as Christ forgave you, He's forgiven you of those sins. All of those sins that you've committed against the Lord, He's forgiven them. They have been washed clean through the blood of Jesus Christ, and He has forgiven them and forgotten your sins. The same way that Christ has forgiven you, we need to have that forgiveness for others. And if you're walking in the Spirit, you can actually do so in joy. Knowing that you're doing right, knowing that you're serving God, we need to have this type of an attitude. And again, your flesh is going to tell you, no way. Your flesh is going to tell you, 
Forget that person. Oh, if they're gonna if they're gonna be like that to me, then I'm gonna be like this to them. They don't deserve they don't respect me, they don't deserve my respect. You know what? That may be true according to the flesh, but when we walk in the spirit, we need to be able to forgive others. We need to be able to keep the 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 you know the, the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace according to Ephesians 4. You know, the Bible even says to 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 pray for your enemies. To pray for them which despitefully use you. Turn if you would to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul gives us, in 1 Timothy 1, Paul gives us a good example of how long suffering we need to be. And he uses him, himself as an example. 1 Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1, look at verse number 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. We see here, Paul is saying, look, I was a blasphemer. He blasphemed God. He was a persecutor. He actually went after and persecuted the church of God. He persecuted people who believed in Christ. And he was injurious. He, he literally injured people and hurt the cause of Christ. He's saying, I did all these things that are contrary to the Lord. He says, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. I was an unbeliever. Verse number 14, And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant, with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Look, God's grace covered all of that sin. God's loving kindness, His long suffering, His mercy and His grace was exceeding abundant over all of those things that, that the Apostle Paul did contrary to the Lord. Verse 15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth with all, all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So he's saying, Paul's saying, you know, I'm using that, but look, of all the sinners, I am the chief. He's saying, I am, you know, the worst of the sinners. But I am here as an example because God has shown mercy unto me. What he's saying is that I'm here as an example unto those which hereafter shall believe. Because God has so much mercy and is full of so much long suffering. Even though the Apostle Paul was attacking and hurting the church, you know, the, 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 the saved are going to be like, Lord, you know, help us. We're being persecuted. And, we, you know, might want judgment to come on Paul, but God is long-suffering because he knows that he was doing it ignorantly in unbelief, and he allowed him to come to the point to where he could receive salvation as well. And we need to have the same type of an attitude of long-suffering. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, chapter number 14. One of the ways that we're going to achieve this is if we're slow to wrath, if we are not quickly angered. And this is something, you know, it goes hand in hand with being long-suffering, right? The way that you suffer things long is by not allowing yourself to get so angry. These are great verses to learn, to memorize real real quick sing, single verses if you have anger problems if people anger you a lot and 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 it's something that sticks in your mind and that stays with you these are great verses to memorize proverbs 14 look at verse 29 the bible says he that is slow to wrath is of great understanding but he that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly so what that means is saying, look, if, you, if you're not angered quickly and easily, if you're slow to wrath, it doesn't mean you never get angry. You can have righteous anger. You can have righteous wrath. But we ought to be slow to wrath. We shouldn't just be set off real quickly to where things make you really, really mad. He says, if you're slow to wrath, you have great understanding. 
You're a smart person if you, can, if you are not easily provoked, if you are not easily just brought to wrath. It says, but he that is hasty of spirit, that means you're real quick. Your spirit is real quick to, to jump to, to being angry or, or whatever emotion. He says, you're exalting, you're lifting up folly. Foolishness is what that is. Folly is foolishness. Turn if you would to chapter 15, Proverbs 15. Look at verse number 18. Proverbs 15, 18 reads, A wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeaseth strife. And isn't that the truth? You know, someone who is, gets really angry and is wrathful, it says they stirreth up strife. They cause a lot more problems. When you get angry, you end up causing a lot more problems. You stir up strife and fighting. It says, But he that is slow to anger appeaseth strife. When you don't let yourself get angry so quickly, when you can keep a level head, when you can be temperate, you can, you can appease the fighting and the strife and you can, you can dissipate it, cause it to go away when you're not allowing yourself to be provoked and just to get angry. Because what happens is when people provoke you, Right? They're, they're provoking you to anger. Maybe they're saying things. They're trying to push your buttons and they want to get you mad. Well, you're going to get mad and you're, going to, you're just going to feed, you know, fuel the fire. You're both just going to get more and more angry and the fight is just going to grow and get bigger and worse. But if you can be slow to wrath, if you can be slow to anger, you know, the other person might be saying and doing things to try to stir you up, try to provoke you, try to start a fight. It's a lot more wise of you to not let yourself get angry and to even forgive that person and to be very long-suffering and let them be the fool. Let them be the one that is, that is in the wrong and that is in error and that's trying to provoke you and getting angry and trying to cause fights. You can be doing what's right. Look at Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16, verse 32. Proverbs 16, 32. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh the city. He's saying, it's much better. You know, you see these real big, strong guys, you know, that, that can fight and they can beat all these people in a fight or whatever, the real strong man. It's better for you to be slow to anger than just to have all these muscles and have all this strength. And he's saying if you're able to rule your own spirit, that means control. You are the ruler. You're in charge of your spirit. You're not going to allow yourself to just fly off the handle. You're not going to allow yourself to be provoked to where you're just going to get so angry that you lose control of your own spirit. But you're in control. You rule your spirit. It says that um, it's better for that person than someone who's able to take and conquer a city. Someone who's able to, to take over and beat down and, and, start and take over a city and rule it. It's better for you to be able to rule your spirit than a city. Turn, if you would, to James chapter 1. We're almost done. It's another shorter sermon this evening. James chapter 1. Last two places we're going. James 1 and then Matthew 18. Long suffering, something I think we all probably need to work on a little bit to be able to, to manage the, the enemies and the, and the strives and the problems that we have in our life, being long suffering. Now, long suffering also doesn't mean silence. It doesn't mean you have to just be quiet and shut up about things. You know, you can still speak, but you need to, to maintain your, you know, rule your spirit. You need to be able to deal with things. We could suffer things long. And, and the long suffering means you don't let that bother you. When people are doing it, you, know, you don't let it stir you up to anger. You can be real slow to anger. You know, realize that they're just being foolish. Now, it doesn't mean you just have to sit there and never say a word. You know, you could respond. You could respond to people and, and you know, um, whatever the situation may be, respond appropriately, not in a way that's going to just cause their, their anger to be enraged or anything like that, but, you know, in a, in a, in a wise way where you can defend yourself or whatever, you know, whatever the appropriate action might be. 
but still be long suffering and and not being quick to, quickly angered. James chapter 1 look at verse number 19 the Bible reads Wherefore my beloved brethren let every man be swift to hear so we need to be to be ready to hear be quick to be able to, to listen slow to speak slow to wrath so we need to be paying more attention to being able to listen to things than to, to quickly responding and quickly just, just giving a retort and, and getting back to people and, or getting angry real quickly. We need to be able to control. This is all part of controlling your spirit of being ready to listen, but slower to speak and definitely slow to wrath. It says, the Bible says in verse 20, For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Matthew 18, the last place we're going to turn. Matthew 18. Matthew 18, we're going to see some great words of wisdom from Jesus Christ. And um, we're going to close it on this last example that Jesus gives about the long suffering that we should have against our enemies, against people that do us wrong, especially within the church. We need to keep the unity and the bond of peace. But even outside the church, I believe that this extends, that we need to, to have a long-suffering attitude. Look at Matthew 18, verse number 21. Matthew 18, 21, the Bible reads, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? So Peter's saying, God, you're saying, Jesus, you know, how often is my brother going to do me wrong? He's going to sin against me. He's going to do things wrong to me. And I still forgive him because you're telling us that we need to forgive. How many times? So, I mean, isn't there a limit? How often can he just continue to do me wrong and I'm just going to keep forgiving him? Like, where is the limit, God? There's got to be a limit somewhere. Jesus, you know, he's talking to Jesus Christ. Verse 22, Jesus answered him. He says, Jesus hath, saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times 7. Now, I don't think that Jesus Christ means 70 times 7, 400. If someone gets 491, then don't forgive them. What he's doing here, which is apparent in Scripture, is he's saying, look, it's not 7 times, and he just throws out a, a, a much higher number, 70 times 7. You know, that's how much. Don't, you know, don't ask me seven times because someone can wrong a person seven times in a day. But he throws out a number like 490. It's kind of hard to, to wrong somebody 490 times in the same day. And I think that's why he throws that number out there. It's just a really high number where he's saying, look, I, you know, it's not seven times. He's saying four, you're seven, 70 times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king. So he's going to explain this now. Why he's telling them, look, you just need to keep, you know, just to have this forgiveness. You need to be able to let these things go. If your brother continues to do you wrong, if it keeps happening, you need to keep forgiving him. Verse number 23. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children, and all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion. Remember we saw that in, in the, one of the earlier verses in Psalms, I believe, that, that God is full of compassion and long-suffering. He was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. So we see, here's a, you know, this ruler, this king. This guy owes him a lot of money. I think it says 10,000 um, 10, talents which is a lot. I mean, 10,000 talents was a lot. You look at even one talent and how much that was worth in the Bible. 10,000 talents he, you know, he's owed to the king. So the king's saying, okay, well, you don't have the money. So you're going to be an indentured servant. You're going to, you know, you and your family, you're going to have to work this off. You're going to have to pay this debt off. You're just going to have to work it, work it off until the debt is satisfied. And the servant falls down, and he's, you know, he, he begs him, you know, please have mercy on me. He's like, look, just give me some more time. I'll pay everything back. 
So what does the king do? The Lord it says, the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion. He has compassion on him. He says, fine, I'm going to forgive you of the whole debt. He doesn't owe him a dime. He borrowed the 10 grand. He owed it. But the king just says, you know what? You're forgiven. He had compassion on him. He could see, you know, he's in, he's in a bad shape. And he says, fine. But look at what that servant does. Verse 28 says, but the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. 10,000 talents is what he owed. Now this other guy owes him 100 pence. Pence is a real small denomination of money. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servants fell down at his feet and besought him saying, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. So the same exact scenario now, the tables have turned. He was in that situation except for a much larger sum of money. And he falls down. He's like, no, please, you know, like, forgive me. May I have mercy on me. I'll pay you. He's forgiven. Then he goes out and his servant, he finds this guy and he's like, you owe me money. You owe me a hundred pence. And the guy does the same exact thing. He falls down. He's saying, look, have mercy on me. I'll pay you. But what does he do? It says, and he would not, verse 30, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So he had no mercy. He just received all this mercy. This abundant mercy was extended upon him. And what does he do? Zero mercy. He's unmerciful. Verse 31, so when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desiredst me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servants, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. So the Bible's saying, look, God, basically, you know, that story is saying, God has forgiven you a lot. And that's the, you know, the 10,000 talents versus his hundred pence. God has forgiven you an enormous amount. So why do you think you can get off and hold other people, you know, hold a grudge over other people and not be merciful and extend your own forgiveness unto them when someone wrongs you, but be lifted up in your own pride and say, oh no, you know, they did wrong to me. I'm going to make them pay. Well, they did this. They broke my, my thing. I let them borrow. So they're going to have to pay for it and be a stickler about it instead of just forgiving them saying, okay, well, you did wrong. I'm just going to forgive you for it. When you don't have that attitude of forgiveness, it's going to just increase the strife. And, um, you know, it's really not right. When God looks at it, it's very displeasing unto the Lord. When He looks down on you, someone who's been forgiven of so much, and sees that you can't forgive the smallest of matters. And be, let's be honest, I mean, most things that, that people have enemies about, what, what are they doing to you? They're saying things that you don't like. Maybe they're gossiping about you. Maybe they're spreading rumors. Maybe they're telling lies. Or maybe they're insulting you or whatever. You know, maybe someone's stolen from you. Okay? Maybe someone is, has damaged your property. That is nothing. That is like the hundred pence compared to the forgiveness that you have received from the Lord Jesus Christ. When God sees you not being able to forgive people, not being able to suffer these things long, not able to control your spirit and to rule your spirit well and to be slow to wrath, it makes him displeased. And you notice all the attributes in that story. What happened to the guy? He was full of anger and wrath and he grabbed him by the throat. And he's like, pay me that thou owest. The exact opposite of the fruit of the Spirit. The exact opposite. Not slow to wrath. Not long-suffering. Not merciful. 
That is the example of the exact wrong thing that we can do. And let's, let's apply that in our lives. Let's make sure that, that we can have, we can be full of mercy, full of um, forgiveness, and have a long-suffering attitude towards Look, it may not be natural, but you need to work on it. You need to put on the new man. You need to walk in that spirit. And I guarantee you, you will have joy. Because that is one of the fruits of the spirit. When you're walking in the spirit, you will have joy. By doing the right thing. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for your words. God, I pray that you would please help us all to be able to, to walk in the Spirit. God, we live in the Spirit. Help us also to walk in the Spirit, dear Lord, and to put on the new man and to die to our, our flesh daily, dear Lord, that um, when people do us wrong, we can pray for them. We can, we can respond in a way that, that's not quick to wrath, not quick to anger, that doesn't have bitterness, dear Lord, and that we can be long-suffering and forgiving. Lord, help us to be able to maintain these type of attributes, dear Lord, that would be one that is demonstrated through the, of, um, of someone that's walking in the Spirit, dear Lord. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.